Welcome to Fantasy Football Today Dynasty. I am your host, Heath Cummings, joined today by Jacob Gibbs. Gibbs is back in the house on FFT Dynasty, and this is the Rookie Wide Receiver Preview Part 2. Gibbs, what's been going on? Yeah, man, it's uh, it's been a very nice offseason for me so far. I've been really grinding a lot lately, getting into all the draft stuff, but I do every offseason take a little bit of time for myself to travel uh, get out of the basement a little bit, get out, get some sunlight. Um, I'm back in Kansas City, so that especially is is needed because it gets pretty brutal here during the winter. Um, so that's been nice. But lately, just really digging into all these prospects. This is such a cool class. I'm so, so psyched to be here talking about wide receiver because that's my favorite position. And we've got a bunch of really exciting guys to talk about. Um, but yeah, just real quick on Sportsline, um, just put out a Beyond the Box Score article. I'm going to be writing articles for Beyond the Box Score this year, which is cool. Um, last year, we started the podcast, me, Dan, and Adam, on FFT, and we'll be doing that as well after the draft. And so you can find that. It's Future Stars. Talk about 15 players. And then I just published my Rookie Wide Receiver Guide. I evaluated 24 receivers and included 20 in that article. So go find that stuff on Sportsline. Great stuff, Gibbs. I, I want you like we'll start off with one of the three questions for you right away, um, because we did do in part one kind of a deep dive with Matt Waldman and Dan Schneier on the top three or top six wide receivers. And according to ADP, Marvin Harrison, Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, Xavier Worthy, Troy Franklin and Brian Thomas. Now, I don't you don't have to comment on whether those are your top six, but I just wonder if you would put we're not going to talk about those guys very much today, but I do want your opinion. Would you put those guys in order and kind of tier them as far as how you see them pre-draft? Yeah, so Thomas is the one who stands out to me. I think most people have him as the wide receiver four right after the big three um, of neighbors, Harrison and Odunze. I worry about him prototypically being a receiver that we can trust for fantasy. He was never someone who drew targets at a high rate in college. And of course, he's playing with Malik Neighbors, but I actually did go and look specifically at his splits when Neighbors was off of the field. And even within that data set, he did not draw targets at a high rate. Um, I think he's just, you know, your prototypical X receiver who's stretching the field, playing a very important real life role. But with the way that NFL defenses are playing so much zone defense and too high safety coverage, it's it's tougher for these types of receivers to be as fantasy relevant. So he's someone who I'm a little bit worried about um, just for fantasy, not a real life evaluation. Troy Franklin is somebody who stands out to me among that group. I really, really like him. He brings a really wide range of outcomes, but he's intriguing. And then Xavier Worthy, of course, he's I have him the lowest of this group. Um, and there's there's so many different ways to go with it. I just tweeted yesterday his off target rate. Career off target rate is 22%. None of the other receivers in this class are even above 17%. So he's significantly above everyone else. Really dealt with some just brutal play at Texas um, at the quarterback position. Um, he's he's a really interesting one as well. But I think that is the clear top six. And then there's a lot of guys beyond that that could push up depending on where they get drafted. So we're going to talk about some polarizing wide receivers today. A.D. Mitchell, Lad McConkey, Keon Coleman, Xavier Get. Roman Wilson, Ricky Pearsall. Oh, he's not polarizing at all. Thomas, maybe we can get Thomas Schaefer to come on and tell us how awesome he is. Uh, but I, but I do want to ask you, Jacob, because we're we're really just kind of breaking down the top twelve in depth. And I know there's at least one guy that we're not going to get to today that you really like. So I want to give you an opportunity to, at the very top of the show, tell everybody about Johnny Wilson. Yeah, Johnny Wilson caught my eye last year. I was really excited to see how he did this year, but it really wasn't a great season form so it's it's tough to tell exactly what to expect he's six foot seven he lined up almost exclusively on the perimeter and so I, a lot of people have talked about him transitioning to tight end it's not like he was used as like a big slot type of guy i guess that could be the move for him at the nfl level but we haven't seen that and if you remove design targets um from the data set he actually had the third highest target per route run rate among the class behind only marvin harrison and malik neighbors so like the Parade data is really, really intriguing for him, but he's played in some really, really run heavy offenses that scored more rushing touchdowns and passing touchdowns. And so his overall body work, not that exciting. Um, but if you just want, you know, an intriguing prospect who could potentially be like really a fantasy relevant player, like I think Wilson is the guy among the late round guys who stands out. I, that's I really 
weren't you're gonna ask me about like my process and just to get into that like now with Wilson, I think he's a good segue. Like there the NFL draft process is so convoluted in terms of like there are so many people providing quality analysis that I think for me, where I can like kind of pigeon myself, pigeonhole myself in with added value is really getting into the per route stuff and the contextual stuff. Um, and so like that showed up last year with Puka Nakua. Obviously, you're not going to be able to find someone like that every draft. People won't stop asking. And I'm not going to say Johnny Wilson is that guy. But the way you found Puka was he had an incomplete collegiate data set because of injuries, because of playing in really run heavy offenses. But all the per route stuff really pointed towards him being strong. And that stuff isn't always going to hit, but it is interesting to make note of when it when it's there. So I, I think what everybody heard there is that Johnny Wilson is Puka Nakua. And so that's fantastic that we got that right at the top of the show. So you did you did kind of transition well there to what you think is what 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 your process is like. And so I just want to ask, like when you talk about that per per route data, you get into a lot of the advanced numbers. Do you still feel like that stuff is is something that's undervalued by NFL teams? Do you think we're moving in a direction to where they're kind of starting to view that stuff even more? Or is that going to be a, a pretty team-by-team -team basis as the, as teams wade into advanced analytics? I think that we're getting there, yeah. And I think, you know, people like Puka, I think potentially might highlight that um, for more teams where it's like, well, how did we not even know about this guy? He wasn't even on our radar, you know what I mean? Um, and so maybe people will start to reevaluate the process a little bit more. Um, but yeah, that's uh, what I'm doing is is looking at per route data and looking at specific splits, like who is performing the best on deep throws, who is performing the best um, at creating yards after contact relative to other players running similar types of routes at similar depths and stuff like that. I'm looking at um, performance versus specific coverage types. Some players really struggle against press coverage and that, you know, there is a decent amount of press coverage at the NFL level. Some teams use it a lot. Um, and if they're only able to play in the slot, like that's a concern. Um, so I'm, I'm really trying to find little things like that, just kind of, you know, turn every stone so we can know as much as we can about these players. Excellent stuff. Let's take our first short break and then we will jump into maybe the most controversial wide receiver prospect in this year's draft, Adonai Mitchell. Okay, so we are back, and I, I think it's interesting, like when you're going through just from a, an overview of these prospects, I tried to put together a little bit of an introduction, and some of them, it's not difficult, even though I know like Matt Waldman's not so, super high on A.D. Mitchell, I don't think you are either, but when you just look at it from like the 10,000 foot range, this does sound like a guy that NFL teams usually get really excited about, six foot mm -hmm. two, 205 pounds, Runs a 4 3 40, still just 21 years old. He played high level college football. Great deep ride receiver. I'm wondering, can he do anything else? Yeah, I I really have a tough time with Mitchell. He at least did like score 11 touchdowns last year. So that gives him something in his production profile. But outside of that, there's almost nothing. He didn't average more than two yards per out run in a single season. And it's really hard to find any players who have been drafted who didn't at least top two yards route run in one season. Like even Jonathan Mingo did it. And Mingo had one of the worst statistical profiles I've ever seen. And so it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how the NFL evaluates Mitchell, because obviously he's a freaky dude in terms of what he can do with his, I mean, 11, four broad jump, four, three, four, 40. Like it's just nuts for someone at his size. Um, but there are actually kind of guys like that. There's no one that's quite as freaky as him. Um, but we're going to talk about Xavier Leggett, somebody I really, really like. And there's guys like that who have actually shown us some semblance of being a productive receiver, which we've never seen from Mitchell. Now, again, contextualize it with the fact that the quarterback play at Texas was not good, especially for downfield weapons like Mitchell. His off-target rate wasn't as high as Worthy's, but it was high. I also think it's interesting that A.D. Mitchell graded out better than Worthy did, according to PFF's receiving grade in 2023. Um, so take that for what it's worth. I, I have a tough time with his prospect profile, and I'm, I'm really going to wait and see where he gets drafted. And then if it's a, a spot where he could be fantasy relevant, I'm going to really just try to dig in and see if I can find anything that's comparable to him 
um, like Terry McLaurin comes to mind as somebody who really did not perform well in college, but then became a stud at the NFL level. Um, but even McLaurin had a better profile than this. Yeah. And so I, you, I look at this and I mentioned on Tuesday's show and I'll mention it again now, like the order we're going through, we're trying to highlight the guys that and according to pre-draft ADP, people seem to be the most interested in drafting. Mm-hmm. And Mitchell is currently wide receiver seven, according to pre-draft ADP. If you were doing a rookie draft before the draft, like, is that too high, too low, just right? And we'll do that with each of the prospects. And then what, what concerns you if it's too, too high with him being that high? Yeah, it's, it's way too high for me. It, it, it reminds me of Mingo, where you're truly just taking a shot on upside, um, except that the, the opportunity cost is way different than it was last year. This year's rookie class is much, much better. Um, I have a tough time, even if he gets an ideal landing spot, I have a tough time considering him a first round. Uh, dynasty pick and and really if you're looking at a super flex league we're for the most part seven i think wide receivers is what we're seeing go in the first round right now because it's four qbs it's brock bowers and it's seven wide receivers i think most likely once we get through the nfl draft it's going to be five wide receivers because there are a couple running backs that go day two and get good landing spots aka whoever the cowboys and the chargers take on day two and those guys end up in round one, but he's still an early round two pick. So like, it, it does sound like we're a little bit negative on him, but I do think, I, I said, I think he's one of the most polarizing players who could go in round one of rookie drafts. And the reason for that is there, there is a lot of reason to believe an upside here, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, just athletically, like I said, he, he's really kind of like unlike anything we've seen. Um, so there's definitely upside. Um, but that's, you're, you're truly just kind of taking a shot in, in the dark on upside. And I, I feel like there's just so many other guys that I'm intrigued by in this draft that I'd rather See, have. Garrett says in the chat, put them on the bills and tell me what you think. And that's going to be the <laughs> answer for all of these wide receivers who might go at the end of round one, unless we yeah. get the bills trading up for one of the top three or four wide receivers. What do you think? And, and we'll finish up with him here. What do you think is the best case scenario for Mitchell? If everything goes right in his NFL career, how how does it look for Edney Mitchell? Yeah, I, I think the Bills would be a great fit. Um, but yeah, it's it's clearly as a, a field stretcher. His average route depth has been ten or more yards every season of his career, and that is really really high. That means the average distance from the line of scrimmage that his initial cut in his route came was ten yards or higher. Um, so he's basically just running deep routes, and I think he could fill that role at a high level he clearly has the explosiveness um to to beat guys down the field Uh, but again for fantasy that's it's a pretty it's a pretty hit or miss role i i think the the name that comes to mind when you talk about that type of profile and needing to be great at it is what we've seen from george pickens the last couple of years um but i'm not sure like do you actually believe that he has as much upside as pickens no i think pickens is a much better receiver from what i've seen Okay, we'll we'll leave it at that. Maybe a, a poor man's George Pickens, <laughs> which which is not great for fantasy football. Let's move on to the guy who is currently wide receiver seven by rookie ADP, and that is Lad McConkey, six foot tall, even on the nose, one hundred eighty six pounds, ran a borderline four like four three nine, I think. But the thing that everyone remembers from the combine is the absolutely flawless gauntlet, um, where he's just like, oh. Wow. And he did test better than I expected. But again, you talk about production profile, never more than 800 yards in a season, never more than seven touchdowns in a season. So at wide receiver seven before the draft, is that, is that too high, too low, or just right for you? And why? Yeah, I'm really, really interested to see how things are going to play out for McConkey. So he was somebody I was really intrigued to um, look into his data because some of the guys that I trust have thrown out some lofty comparisons. Like um, I've heard Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson used as comparisons for him. Um, even Tyler Lockett from Matt Harmon. Yep. And I guess I, I didn't, I could see Lockett like early career where he's mostly working from this slot. But what, what I found with McConkey that, that bothered me was he really, really struggled against press coverage. Um, and that's what Matt's grades um, bared out as well. I, I am worried that he might get pigeonholed into like only a slot type of role, um, which he could still be productive from. But like people have been, you know, talking about his ability to win down the field. And that I think that shows up on film when you watch him. Um, but his 
some of the underlying data just really isn't that great. So he wasn't very good against man coverage either. He was much, much better against zone. And typically you you want uh, a receiver that you're going to be drafting in the first few rounds to be able to dominate man coverage at the collegiate level. Um, and so it does bother me a little bit when something like that pops up. And then really his production profile isn't that great, partially because of injuries. But then even when you do parse it down to the per route data, he really just had one season where he had good per route data. That was his final season. And that came on a really small sample size. Outside of that, he really wasn't very productive, even on a per route basis. Um, so I think McConkey is interesting. I think he has the tools and people really, really love um, his quickness and just the crispness that he runs his routes with. And so this stuff might not matter. He was playing, he was competing with Brock Bowers for targets. Um, and he was just asked to line up on the outside and do the big boy stuff. And so like that could have definitely impacted his production. Um, so I think it's going to be like, we're going to say with a lot of these guys, it's going to be contingent on where he lands. Um, but if he gets a high draft pick, like the tools are there. But he is not a top seven wide receiver for you right now in this class. Is that right? He's he's right there on the borderline. The way I okay. see that, Lad McConkey is more like Sterling Shepard, like best case outcome, something like that, um, or potentially more like a Devin Duvernay kind of player. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not quite as excited about him as a lot of people are. Um, uh, yeah, I think the comp I saw over on Player Profiler was was Percy Harvin. What I was going to say is I think people are going to missing. see people are going to see him. And see that he's strictly a short area PPR specialist out of the slot because of the picture. Uh, I, he did have quite a few big plays, though, right? Like this guy has yeah, some ability yeah. to do things after the catch as well. There's an athletic profile here. Oh yeah, that's for sure. And is it like most of his catches were explosive? Honestly, like that's that's what Georgia was asking him to do, and he did it pretty well. Um, but it was, I, I do worry a little bit about his data against slot or against um, press and man coverage, and like how that will translate. To the NFL level, is he going to be able to run those types of rests at the NFL level and win? I, I would guess no, um, which might leave him as mostly just a slot threat. But yeah, he can he can create after the catch for sure. Good stuff. So, what, what do you think um, in terms of the safer profile? Would you say that he has a safer profile than Mitchell does, but maybe not quite as much upside? Yeah, I have him definitively ahead of Mitchell. He, um, yeah, he falls in the same range as like Leggett and Xavier Worthy and Roman Wilson, Jermaine Burden. I think he's ahead of Wilson and Burden. And then do you think that McConkey has the upside to be a legitimate top 24 dynasty wide receiver at any point in his career? I think so. I think if he's in the perfect role, he could um, like the Elijah Moore role his rookie year, like that kind of that kind of player, like where he really is dynamic from the slot um, and you can move him around and he could probably win from the flanker as well. Um, what I've seen suggests that he's probably, you know, that's the extent. He's not going to be like a true wide receiver one, um, which is why I, I back off of the Chris Olave Garrett Wilson comparisons a little bit. But yeah, I think top 24 is feasible. And, and that is interesting because like we've seen Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson function as the true wide receiver ones on their team. And we've ranked them as top 12 dynasty wide receivers just without hesitation. But in terms of fantasy, actual fantasy production early in their career, they've really been more low end number two type or even number threes in some years because of circumstances. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're saying so when you say number one, you mean he doesn't have the potential to be a fantasy wide receiver one or an NFL wide receiver one from McConkey? Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm potentially a fantasy wide receiver one if it's an ideal spot. Um, right. But yeah. Yeah. I was talking about real, real life wide receiver one. That is Lad McConkey. Let's go to the guy who is currently, what are we up to? Wide receiver nine now by rookie ADP. And that is Keon Coleman. And I, again, I, I said Adonai Mitchell was, was the most polarizing wide receiver. This range is full of mm -hmm. widely polarizing wide receivers. And it's not hard to see why with Coleman doesn't even turn 21 until the middle of May, six, three, 213 pounds. Not, not very fast though. We'd run a four, four, six, 40 spent two years at Michigan state before finishing at FSU. It's another guy who like McConkey doesn't have um, the great counting stats, but his share of his team's production was much better, right? It was, yeah. He he was his profile is a little bit better than McConkey uh, or than um, Adonai Mitchell. Yeah, Th those two are like easy to compare for me, just in terms of like they've got the size. He obviously doesn't have the speed that Ad Mitchell does, um, but they've got the size to fill this hypothetical role 
but we never really saw them be highly productive at the collegiate level. Um, but yeah, Coleman, I, I thought what he turned in this past year was pretty encouraging. I'm curious to see where he'll get drafted after running so slow. He seems like somebody who's just going to continue to fall down boards. Um, he didn't grade out very well for me, just given the incomplete nature of his collegiate data, but he is really young. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see where he lands. I'm trying to find him in my rankings. Yeah. He's just below AD Mitchell. Um, and some guys I have ahead of him who I, I think this is probably way off consensus, but like, uh, Ricky Persa for sure. Um, Javon Baker, I really like Devontas Walker. Like even, I think you, depending on fit could put somebody like Malik Washington ahead of these guys for fantasy purposes. Um, and that's, I guess, again, what it comes down to is there's a lot of these prototypical X receivers that like could just fill the Alec Pierce role at the NFL level. You know what I mean? And it's like, we, the, it's interesting like to, to speculate on what kind of prospect they might be, if they can be a contributor for real life football, but I don't know if Keon Coleman's ever going to be very good for fantasy. Okay. And that's again, I, some of these guys get locked into these spots and then they just don't really move very much in, in the in, until the draft. It feels like Coleman is the type of player who based on where he gets drafted and who he gets drafted by is going to have to move a lot for a bunch of analysts, right? Because people either see him as this as this top 12 dynasty wide receiver or, or like you, way, way down. But if the NFL decides, no, he's a he's a day two pick and this good team likes him, then then that like he's just and it, it's you don't want to say that with every wide receiver in this class, but for me, he feels more dependent on who he's with than some of these other wide receivers we're talking about today. For sure. What do you see in terms of uh, realistic upside from Coleman? Um, <laughs> yeah, like I, I, I hate this because I always go to T. Higgins as the comparison because that, like, he's the like big ball winner. I guess George Pickens, but he's a lot more athletic than mm -hmm. Coleman. Um, that can be fantasy relevant is like has been Higgins, um, but even Higgins, like we've seen lately, even when he's been healthy, that like he's just not getting the targets that he kind of needs. And like, that's the concern that's so like, yeah, I think that's like the top of the range of outcomes for him. Um, from what I've seen is that kind of a player. And you think it's more likely that you'll be drafting him after the NFL draft in round three of rookie drafts or round one. Round three is more likely for me. Than... <laughs> okay. Again, and, and I, I we're not going to, there's a couple of guys that we get to in just a minute that, that Jacob's going to be higher on than what mm -hmm. ADP is, but that's kind of the reason that I chose this approach towards the end of the show. We're going to talk about three or four wide receivers that like Johnny Wilson are not in the top 12 in terms of rookie ADP, but Jacob does like them more than some of the guys that we're talking about right now. But I think what a lot of people are going to do when they get to their rookie drafts is they're going to want to know, okay, my favorite analyst, what do they think of this wide receiver? And then they're going to go look at ADP. And so a lot of times you'll see guys catching falling knives in round two because right. they were late round one picks before the draft. Things went terribly for them on draft day. And people look at the ADP and say, well, his ADP is like 13th, and now he's available at 19th, so I should take him here. Um, if Keon Coleman's one of those full falling knives, you should probably just let him fall to someone else. Would you agree with that? Yeah, no, this is good practice. It hasn't been very fun for us because we're just like uh, kind of negative about these guys. <laughs> I, I don't want to be too negative about Lad McConkey. I think he is exciting. Um, I just wasn't quite as excited by what I found as I hoped to be based off some of the comparisons that I'd heard. And I am excited about some of these next guys we're going to get to. Absolutely. Let's take one more short break and then we will get to uh, let's, let's get Jacob excited. Okay, so we are back, and wide receiver 10 by current rookie ADP is Xavier Leggett. You mentioned him already. Almost like the opposite prospect of Keon Coleman. The, the size isn't that much different. Coleman's a couple inches taller. Leggett, 6'1", 221, but he ran a 4'3". He is blazing fast. He's also already 23 years old. Had a monster season last year at South Carolina. 71 catches, 1,255 yards, 7 touchdowns. Not many guys that we're talking about today have done what he did in terms of actual production in his last season, but there was very little production before that to bank on. So again, at wide receiver 10 in this class, I know you likely get more than some of the guys we've talked about. Is that about right for him? 
Yeah, and I think there's a potential for him to push much, much higher. I think for me, he might end up being the guy that's like right after the like stuck in stone, like top guys, you know what I mean? Like Bowers and the quarterbacks. And once they're off the board, it's like Leggett. Um, I think he brings really exciting upside. When I try to compare him after like watching him and then digging into how he was winning um, in his final season, it's like some kind of like Dwayne Bow player, like Marquez Colston kind of guy. Like he's really good at winning at the catch point, but he's way faster than those guys. And so then who the heck do you compare him to? Like AJ Brown? Um, I don't want to throw out that comparison because to me, AJ Brown is like one of the best receivers we've seen in a very long time. Um, but yeah, he's an absolute freak athletically and he really backed it up with the production um, in his final season. And it took him till his fifth season. And that is unusual. There are not very many prospects who have done that and that have been successful. But if you look into, you know, the why, I think that there's a lot of context that makes sense as to why on and off the field, it took a long time for Leggett to really find his footing. And when he did, like he was unbelievable, unbelievably efficient, um, drew targets at a high rate. He was winning all over the field. He dominated press coverage. He dominated man coverage. And he was pretty productive against zone coverage as well. I Nothing that I found from his, his breakout season, his real like true season as a wide receiver one, stood out as fraudulent at all, um, which has not been the case with somebody like Traylon Burks or someone like that who, you know, has this big production, but like we've got questions about whether he can really play the wide receiver position. Right. And I think that's that's the question with Leggett. I'm really curious to get Matt Harmon's full take. He, I don't think he has his um, profile on Leggett out quite yet, um, but I have heard him mention that like he's not nearly the type of route runner that some of these other guys are, even like, you know, Brian Thomas potentially. Um, so I think he might still have a, a ways to go in terms of refining his game. Um, and that is a little concerning because he's already old, right? He's going to be almost 24 by the time the season starts. <laughs> I, love, I love the fact that we're talking about these guys. Like, yeah, he's, just, he's already ancient. <laughs> but, but you're right. And that was kind of going to be my next point was like for the most part, when you talk about the profile, when you talk about the, stu the advanced stats that you, that you like to look at, when you talk about the size-speed combination, this looks like a guy who should not be wide receiver 10. Right. um the the 23 can can age 23 can make up for part of that because it is easier to dominate in college football if you're two to three years older than a lot of the guys you're playing against and those ages of development in terms of size and speed and strength do, do matter quite a bit but what is is it just the route running is that the other major question mark that's holding down you think his ranking I think so. And maybe concerns that, like I've already mentioned with a lot of these guys, he's just going to be an X field like stretching receiver. That's not going to be that good for fantasy, not going to draw a ton of targets or something like that. I think that could be a concern as well. Um, but I, I, I think he has the potential to be more than that based off what I found. And like, when I say he's dominating, it's truly like elite territory, like him and only CD lamb and Devonte Smith and people like that have been this good against press coverage, this good against man coverage, stuff like that. Um, and I think at the very least, he does bring that skill set right away, the deep ball skill set. He's been one of the, like this season was one of the most efficient deep ball um, seasons we've ever seen from a receiver. Right. Do you, do you think that like within his profile, it's a possibility that he becomes an NFL team's true number one wide receiver or is his best case scenario kind of being a, a really good one B on a really good pass offense? It's hard to tell because I feel like his development has come so late um, in terms of learning the receiver position and really coming into his own as a wide receiver one. And we only have this one season of data on it. For what it's worth, his target rates in this season were just below like A.J. Brown. A.J. Brown had more target competition. Um, it's I think it's you can could you could possibly like envision that kind of a role for him in the right offense, in the right setting where like there's not that much target competition and they can kind of ease him into that kind of role, get him some catch and run stuff and, you know, like let him develop his route running and potentially be that guy. Um, but I, I don't think it's likely. I think that's on the very top of his ranges of outcomes.
I, I will say, like in comparing him to Coleman, where we're not even sure how excited we are about taking him in round two, this sounds like exactly the type of receiver I want to take in round two of my rookie draft. The guy that, yeah, yeah the floor is not very good, but you shouldn't really care that much about floor in round two anyway. And the ceiling's absolutely insane on like a play or game or maybe individual season basis. Yeah. So like if he goes to the Panthers or something, like if he if he was in the Mingo role from last year that like we thought he could maybe get some slot work and some catch and run stuff and then also be a deep guy, I think he would be way better than Mingo. He his target drawing is way above anything we saw from Mingo. But if he goes to like the Chiefs or something like that, where there are already established guys, I don't think he's gonna be relevant for fantasy at all. I think he'll be in the Justin Watson role. Um and eventually could maybe be more than that, but it's not a I think it's really going to be context dependent on where he lands, if he's going to be on a wide receiver one type of track. Um, but that upside I think does exist. Let's talk about wide receiver 11 by ADP now. And that is Roman Wilson, a guy who I think I might've been a higher on before I really started looking at him <laughs> like, yeah. like the, or started off early is like, Oh yeah. And then yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure he turns 23 in June. He's five foot 11, 185 pounds. He does have borderline four, three speed. He did mm-hmm. have 12 touchdowns at Michigan last year, but also his 52 receiving yards per game was a career high. I think like Coleman, because of the situation he is in, you need to look at his receiving shares and not his totals, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm curious how he compares to Ricky Pearson for you because the two, I think, are actually pretty similarly, and I I don't really know why Wilson's ahead of him. It seems like he's definitively ahead of him in most of those rankings. Yeah, I think as of right now, I would prefer Ricky Pearsall. I have more hope that he can do stuff after the catch, but I don't want to steal too much of Thomas Schaefer's thunder because oh, <laughs> Ricky okay. Pearsall is the next player on the list. And that that might have been a better way to do it with these two players. It's just kind of a compare and contrast who should be wide receiver 11. You, I think you're much higher on Pearsall than you are on Wilson. So what what are your concerns with Roman Wilson's profile? Yeah, he wasn't very good after the catch. His overall production wasn't all the exciting. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily down on him. I think the two are very, very similar, and it'll depend on where they get drafted. To me, they're kind of like Curtis Samuel, um, potentially Christian Kirk type of guys that they can win from the slot. I don't think he's as good after the catch as Curtis Samuel, um, but they can win down the field as well. Like Robert Woods maybe is a good comparison as well. Um, his average depth of target was 14 yards for his career, Roman Wilson. And that really surprised me for somebody who worked mostly out of the slot. And I think that that does, that helps contextualize the low target rates a little bit and the low production is that he was used in a sort of weird role. That's just, they, they really were running a lot and then doing play action, deep stuff. Um, and so it wasn't a, a typical, like, Malik neighbors working in the slot and being the clear like engine for the offense kind of a role for Roman Wilson. And so like, maybe that's why his targets and production weren't that good because athletically he looks really good. PFF graded him really well as a receiver. Um, there are, you know, reasons for optimism, but yeah, he's 23 years old and the production is not that great. Well, that's what, when I was reading Waldman's profile, it sounded like he saw, thought he saw him more as like a developmental player in yeah. the NFL and maybe in a year or two, well, I don't want to draft a 23 year old that's right. maybe going to be good when he's 25. Like, I guess maybe a little bit more attractive if you have a taxi squad spot, but even then, um, it definitely feels like maybe a, a, gonna be a round three pick by the time we get to real rookie drafts. Um, but you know, if he's a round two pick in the NFL draft, that won't be the case. All right, we we've waited long enough, and and I did just spring this on Thomas in the private chat, but the first guy that I heard talking about Ricky Pearsall was Thomas Schaefer. And so he's going to come on here after I give the breakdown. 6'1", 189 pounds, another 23-year-old. So he is old, but he has 4'4 speed. He played two years, what, at Arizona State and two at Florida. Career best last year with 965 receiving yards. Thomas, come on and give us like the most optimistic scouting report anyone's ever heard on this kid. <laughs> Well, actually, back in October, Dan Schneier was in town, and it was after uh, Pearsall had that game against Charlotte where he has that one-handed catch that went viral. And I'm like, dude, you have to check this guy out. Like, Florida's team has been so bad for so long. This is the only guy that's out here making plays that, like, like you know, you know when you see, like, a Hall of Fame. I'm not saying he's a Hall of Famer, but when you see a flashy guy and you're like, oh, that's what a Hall of Famer is. That's what a great player is. Like, that's what he was doing at Florida on these garbage teams. So I was like, dude, you got to check him out. He's going to be a sleeper this draft class. And then 
all of a sudden he has a great senior bowl, then he has a great combine, and now he's not a sleeper anymore. So I told him my composition, my comp to him was Adam Thielen because he was an older prospect. Thielen was old coming out. So, you know, not maybe an, an immediate impact, but give him a year or two to develop and potentially he can be a really, really good starter in the NFL. And I, I still feel that way. I think there's a little bit more hype now with him. So he's not a sleeper, like, like I said, but no, he's, he's, a, he's a great player. And I, I really wanted him to somehow fall to the Vikings. That would just be amazing for me, but no, I, I love this guy. I think he's a star. Well, I don't, I'm not sure for his dynasty value we want him to to fall to the Vikings because cu- putting him in the same receiving room with Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison might not work out well for his target share considering they don't have a quarterback. But no, I I, I appreciate that. Now, Jacob, I, I think that you're relatively fond of him, but it seems like everybody I talk to, and maybe that's just this guy I talk to Thomas more than anybody else, is really saying they are higher on this guy than consensus. So why isn't he ranked higher? His production is not good, um, and you could point towards Florida just being dysfunctional as the reason for that, but it's, like, really not good, um, especially on a per-route basis. Like, I think his single-season high target per-route runner was, like, 23% or something, and it's like, that's barely going to get it done at the NFL level as a starting slot um, for fantasy purposes. Yeah, 22.5% in five seasons, um, three of which he had significant amount of routes. Um so yeah, he's not drawing targets at a high rate, which is weird um, for a slot guy. He did work down the field though quite a bit. Like that year where he drew twenty three percent, his average depth of target was seventeen yards, um, which is just pretty absurd for a slot guy. So yeah, he. I think Christian Kirk is a decent comparison at, at the top end. I think he's to me, Pearsall is similar to Roman Wilson. He's he can stretch the field from the slot, and that is an intriguing skill set. Um, he's a little bit bigger. But I, I just wish that we had more um, from him to believe in the data. Like, why isn't he producing if if we expect that he'll be able to at the rece- at the NFL level? It's the Florida offense, just like they ruined Anthony Richardson two years ago. Like, we we do a lot of, like, sideways stuff. Like, if you just watch a Florida game, you'll be like, how how is this team, like, functioning in actually winning games? Because, yeah. like you said, re- like, we didn't use Ricky enough, and – I mean, he was still our leading receiver, and he only—I think he only had like four touchdowns or whatever. But you know, our quarterback play hasn't been great. In no, he had our- he had the third highest off target rate career um, in this class, eighteen percent. Yeah, that, 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 you saw a lot of off target throws, right, Thomas? Yeah, uh, <laughs> Graham Mertz, Dan Schneier knows a lot about him. He was a <laughs> a, a Wisconsin transfer, so uh, I think for what what we had, we got a lot out of him. So. If he was playing with a Caleb Williams or Jaden Daniels, he, he was with Jaden Daniels at Arizona State before. Um, I, I think we would have seen a lot bigger production with a, an actual offensive mind. Mm-hmm. So uh, you, you played the villain role where, well there, Jacob. I, I appreciate that, Thomas, uh, give, giving you the fluff. And I will say, I have, like I said, I, I hear more people optimistic about Ricky Pearsall than I do hear them pessimistic. And I think you look at uh, Matt Waldman, and I I try not to give away too much of his rankings, but he's got him ranked ahead of five wide receivers that we've talked about in depth this weekend. Now, so like there, there's plenty of like, you would rather have, so you, you are kind of undecided Jacob on Pearsall versus Wilson. Is that right? Just like, let's see who the NFL likes more. Yeah, basically. What about him versus um, Mitchell? I think I would go with – I would lean towards Mitchell just because of the upside. Um, but if he gets like a great landing spot, then I would go with Pierce or Wilson over Mitchell. And last one I'll ask is him or uh, Keon Coleman. Um, yeah, I'll go with the slot guys over Coleman. I think it's really a, a tough – task to try to project Coleman to be relevant for fantasy. So again, I think you expect Ricky Pierce all at the end of round two, early round three in your rookie drafts. If you're more optimistic about him and you want to reach in the middle of round two, or if you're drafting with Thomas and he picks after you, you should definitely take him in the middle of round two if you want to get him. Now that there are a few guys here that do not rank amongst the top 12 in ADP that, that Jacob wanted to make sure we got to. We actually already had a question about one of them in the chat, and we had several questions in the chat on Tuesday about this guy. So I just want to know, like, did you study Malik Washington at all? And and where are you at on him? 
Yeah, Malik Washington is cool. He um, spent four years in Northwestern doing basically nothing. And they went to Virginia and just put up one of the craziest seasons that we've seen statistically. Um, five foot eight, 194, four, four, seven. So he's probably just a slot. That's basically where he played, um, at Virginia almost exclusively, but he was really, really just wildly productive last year. Um, and it came on a really low a dot. So if this is the, this is the group to think about, I think with Malik Washington, only four receivers dating back to 2016 have been selected in the NFL draft and finished a season with a yard per route run rate above three his was 3.58 so higher than any of these guys while also posting an average depth of target below nine yards and that's paris campbell kiki qt devin duvernay and josh downs that's not a great group it's not a great group and i think downs shows a lot um more as like a real receiver winning at the you know contested catch point stuff like that than washington um i haven't watched a ton of washington's tape or anything like that but yeah i think he falls into that kind of group I do think that like with the way the NFL is being played and move and changing, like it's possible that this kind of player can be more productive. I was a Paris Campbell guy back in the day. I thought he could be productive if given the chance. Um, but so yeah, I, I don't remember coming out, but like five, eight, one ninety four is pretty thick. Yeah. It, I would assume that like, I know Paris Campbell in terms of athleticism really blew some people away, but he's not been able to stay healthy in, in the NFL. Um, it, is does Washington pop a little better after the catch maybe, or look like somebody that could maybe not, nobody's going to be Debo out of this role, but could he, could he play that Debo Samuel role a little bit? I think so. I think he, I think Malik Washington is a good segue to Corley, who you're pretty excited about, right? In terms of like the thickness that you're talking about, like he right. might be able to survive. Well, with Malachi Corley, it's just like, there's, there's a couple of things that I worry about that I think that who because there's a lot of talk about him being a day two wide receiver now. And if mm -hmm. a team's going to take him on day two, I don't think they care that much about what his downfield route running is like. I'm not sure they worry that much about, can he succeed with a higher a dot? I don't think they worry that much about the lack of competition that he faced in conference USA. And so those are the main concerns for me. If you give him to a team that has a good creative play caller and is just going to use him in that Curtis Samuel, Debo Samuel type role with short area targets and let him work after the catch. I'm pretty sure he's going to be good at that in the NFL or at any level. Yeah. One last note on uh, Malik Washington. He had the yes. second highest, second highest PFF receiving grade of any receiver. Only Malik Neighbors was higher last year. And they graded him as perfect on deep targets. So maybe he could do <laughs> probably not. <laughs> he can he can do just a little bit of everything. So you would prefer at, as of right now, Malik Washington over Malachi Corley. Is that right? He did grade um better just because like his one season production was so insane. Um right. but I, I think Cor like when draft capital is factored in, it's gonna be Corley. And I do think Corley's gonna go pretty high, especially with the change to the kick return rule, I think he like really might be viewed as a dangerous weapon. Somebody's going to take him high. I kind of wondered because there's been this talk about San Francisco not being able to keep a hold hold of Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel, and it, the way they talk, it sure sounds like they're more likely to deal Debo than they are Ayuk. I wonder if they could get a second for Debo and use a third on Corley and just plop him right into that role. If that happened, like people would be so excited for Corley. If he just slides right into the Debo, he'd be a round one rookie pick. I think he might be, <laughs> <laughs> which would be so hard to make sense of, like given how he grades out. Um, but I, I think that he might be, and it might make sense, honestly, if he's in San Fran. Now, I wish I would have asked Matt Waldman about this guy because he he has him very high, and I know that you are also pretty high on Jermaine Burton. So we can take just a little bit more time on Burton and just talk about, you know, probably not a guy we've talked about on this podcast quite enough. I've not heard a whole lot of buzz about his draft capital, but I do want to make sure that, that we get him into the conversation here, not somebody who's being drafted as a top 12 wide receiver in early rookie drafts at least. Yeah, the more that I've dug into Burton, actually, I don't love that he graded out so well. My model, I might test that after um, this year and see why. Because like nothing about him stands out as that exciting. He has a decent data profile. Um, his efficiency is pretty good. Um, he has not drawn targets at a high rate, um, but that's because again, he's one of these guys who's really used almost exclusively as a deep threat. Um, but yeah, I think he is a good 
player um, and is good at stretching the defense. But I, I again, like don't know how relevant he's going to be for fantasy purposes. Um, but he was he was really effective with the opportunities he got when he was at Alabama. Well, and I, that's that's what I think you would say is like the six one or six foot one ninety six is not that exciting, but it's not a negative mark. And a, a mid four four forty is pretty good. And the the share of the production at Alabama is okay. And he was good on the type of thing that but that the question is, and it's the question we've had for a lot of these wide receivers, can Jermaine Burton be more than a one trick pony, or is he strictly a guy who's going to be the deep threat and take the top off of defenses? Yeah. I think that's why I graded out so well in my model is because it's like he's elite at doing these specific things, like as a deep threat and even like did really well on um, in the red zone and stuff like that. Um, at Georgia, his second season at Georgia, he was second on the team receiving by handling Brock Bowers. He got 87% of his targets, even with a 14 and a half yard A dot. Like that's absurd. Um, so there's just a lot of signal that he might actually be a good player. I don't know how it will translate at the NFL level. So we've talked about a lot of wide receivers on this show. Xavier Leggett, Keon Coleman, Lad McConkey, A.D. Mitchell, some guys that people really are unsure about how to rank, and, and we're probably going to get a better answer after the draft. We are definitely going to talk with Jacob after the draft about these guys. Are there, are there any wide receivers that we – like we've kind of scraped, I feel like, all of the guys who are super relevant at this point, anybody else who you think, you know, might just pop, might end up getting drafted in the third round or the fourth round and turning into a thing. I'm curious to see where Javon Baker goes. Um, okay. he, had, he had a near elite PFF receiving grade and yard per route run rate last year, 2023. Um, pretty decent target rates, even while really operating in a downfield role. And so he's an exciting guy who would definitely like shoot up the rankings if he, lands in an appealing offensive environment if he like goes to the bills or something like yeah um i think that'd be a perfect fit luke mccaffrey is interesting not just because he's christian mccaffrey's brother he's a pretty decent athlete transition from quarterback to receiver in his final two collegiate receive um collegiate seasons he was a receiver and he performed pretty well from the slot and the perimeter he's got size and he actually was more productive from outside than in so i don't think he's just a slot guy and he's still learning the receiver position um, so I'm, I'm interested in him as well. And then I, I think that this is fraudulent production. I think this is maybe Jalen Tolbert's type stuff, but Devontae's okay. Devontae's Walker, um, no receiver prospect account for a higher percentage of their offensive touchdowns went on the field than him. He was also third in terms of percentage of his team's yardage went on the field. He began his career at Kent state. So that definitely has something to do with it. And his efficiency dropped across the board at North Carolina. Um, and he didn't grade out well according to PFF either. So that's why I say take this all with a grain of salt. But he's got size, he's got speed, and if he gets drafted on day two, like I think he's somebody that is going to be interesting potentially for fantasy. And I, I do think I just we'll just close up with that. Like we've talked a lot about draft capital, and Adam Azer had a had a tweet that he'd put up or or from the CBS Sports article actually about the number, like basically half of the quarterbacks taken in round one in the last 15 years have been busts. And I started kind of wondering, like, is the wide receiver hit rate any better than that? And if you go back, teams have made some enormous and laughable mistakes <laughs> over the last 10 years drafting wide receivers in round one and in round two. Um, the, the order that they rank them in it has not been hugely indicative of the success that they have in fantasy football. So what we are going to care a lot about where these guys end up and about what their draft capital is. But do you see a, a huge difference between round one and round two or round two and round three? Like where's the cutoff for you or is it strictly, do they get drafted on the first two days or do they fall later? Yeah, I don't have any hard rules. Um, like I said at the beginning of this, like draft evaluation isn't necessarily in my wheelhouse in terms of what I think I bring to the space, the fantasy right. work. Um, and so like I haven't gotten that granular with it when like like really establishing rules. Um, and partially because I do think the context is so important. It's, to me, it's more about how they fit on the team, what yeah. type of role they might play, given like what we know about them and what they did at the collegiate level. And does it all make sense? Like the, like Puka, it made so much sense, the role that they drafted him to play. Um, I feel like Tank Dell last year like made perfect sense as, as a pairing with CJ Stroud. 
And obviously we're nitpicking guys who performed well and out, right. outperformed the draft capital. But yeah, I, I, that's kind of how I look at it. And also there's even like the context of like the team, did they move up? Like what type of capital did they have available? Like not every day three pick is the same. Um, did, did the quarterback tell the team to draft him? <laughs> right. Are they are they rooming together at training camp? Did they eat breakfast together? Like there's there's lots lots of different factors we're going to take into account over the next several months. But Jacob, that was fantastic stuff. I want to remind everybody go follow him on Twitter at j a gibbs underscore twenty three. Tell everybody again about the piece that you just came out with on Sportsline and what they can find there. Yeah, so I just uh, recapped all the receivers. It's like six thousand words and just like really goes through all of the advanced data stuff for them i try to just find data that is not publicly accessible you're not going to get um most places to really give you just like additional context on these guys so if you've already kind of exhausted like all the <laughs> draft um prep that you think you can do like maybe not there might be more you can find on sports and i think you'll have fun in there reading about all these guys and i think i'm going to add to it depending on where the draft capital ends up going like some of these guys javon baker malik washington didn't get a profile, but they're probably going to get a profile at some point. Awesome stuff. As always, Jacob, always appreciate you being here. Appreciate everybody in the chat. You guys gave us some good questions today. Everybody listening to the podcast, you definitely want to listen next week as well. It's the running back preview part one on Tuesday with JJ, AKA late round QB part two on Friday with Emory hunt. It is like you've heard a lot of people give the we're going to see where these guys land and then we'll talk about how good these running backs are next week. We're going to talk about these running backs outside of the context of landing spot and I could not be more excited. So make sure you tune in next Tuesday.